Good afternoon. Welcome to Brookings. My name is Bruce Jones. I'm the Vice President for Foreign Policy here at Brookings. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation, and uh, a very timely one, with Rachel Kite, who is the CEO and the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All, commonly known as SEU for All, just because it's too damn long as a <laughs> title. Uh, Rachel, who is also a professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, served previously as the Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change at the World Bank, the Vice President for Sustainable Development at the World Bank, and the Vice President for Business Advisory Services at the International Finance Corporation. I've known Rachel for some time, and I can say without hesitation that she is, without any question, the most knowledgeable and experienced leader working in this field in the international space today, and we're delighted to have her here at Brookings. This is the third in a series, a newish series that we're doing that brings leaders from international organizations, from industry, and from academia to Brookings to highlight the most important energy and climate challenges of our time. Previous speakers included Fatih Biral of the International Energy Agency and um, Charlie Crane from Exelon. It stems from an effort that David Victor and I co-chair designed to draw on the whole breadth of Brookings scholarship from foreign policy to domestic issues to metropolitan issues to look at the challenge of energy and climate from a multidisciplinary perspective as well as from a geopolitical perspective. I'd like to single out uh, Todd Stern, who's joined the program over the last year or so, who's part of the effort, and Samantha Gross, who helps direct the effort here at Brookings. The topic of the conversation today is an essential one, uh, and SE for All is really at the core of the international effort to think hard about how to manage and how to implement energy access in the developing world with the goal of providing access to modern energy services to the whole of the world's people who don't have it by 2030. But to do so in a way that balances with a wider objective of a transition to a lower carbon energy mix, and that's a, a very thorny problem. There's still a billion people in the world who lack access to basic electricity, three billion who cook with traditional biomass. And this lack of access to modern energy is harmful for economic development, it's harmful for health, for human dignity. Uh, just to dramatize one element, several million people a year die from pollution due to traditional cooking fuels. But this has to be managed in a context where uh, we're aiming towards a lower overall carbon emissions in our energy mix, and that striking that balance is, I think, the crux of the challenge. All in a context where decisions in one uh, major economy profoundly affect the options in another major economy at a time when multilateralism is strained, to say the very least. Uh, I think the issues we're going to be talking about, certainly the climate issues, have been highlighted and sort of amplified in recent weeks. We had the report, the recent report of the International uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which warned about the magnitude of the potential impacts of rising temperatures and extreme weather events. And we're watching what's happening in California, which the director of CAL FIRE has explicitly linked to a changing, a changing climate. And there's pretty good evidence to back that up. So I'm delighted that we're able to host this conversation today. And my thanks to Rachel for joining us. And I'm delighted that David Victor, who co-chairs the Cross Brookings Initiative on Energy and Climate, is going to be here to lead the conversation. So before I turn it over to David, Rachel, why don't you come up and, and make a few remarks. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Um, thank you, David, uh, and to the team here for the invitation. It's always a great honor to be here uh, at Brookings. Um, I just want to uh, sort of set a bit of context, sort of how, how do you see a pathway forward? I mean, how do you imagine that we could arrive at a decarbonized economy by 2050, the Sustainable Development Goal by 2030, that there should be universal access to reliable, affordable, clean energy. That's not exactly what the goal says, but um, I think the Paris Climate Agreement and then the IPCC report of 1.5 degrees kind of takes away any of the wiggle room or space uh, for a, a fossil fuel powered solution to access. And so I think it's important to just sort of step back and, and, and think through the building blocks of an energy transition or energy transitions that would allow us to arrive at a point where everybody has access to reliable, affordable, clean power um, and, and how we will have done that. So I think the, the, the important thing is that the decarbonization of the energy system uh, or, and increasingly in the future systems 
um, is, is going to be at the leading edge of uh, dragging the global economy to the point of decarbonisation. Uh, those energy, that, that transition is already underway in a number of economies. Um, and the exact shape of that um, transition is, um, uh, I think, up for grabs. Um, there are mostly known knowns. Um, the question is whether or not we have the political will, determination and the institutions uh, that are capable of expediting and speeding up uh, that transition. So what I focus on in most of my work with my team in SE for All and in the conversations at the UN is how do we achieve the speed and scale in the decarbonisation of the energy systems? The energy systems of the future are going to be increasingly decentralised, uh, largely because of the revolution of renewable technologies. They are going to be increasingly digitalised, and that's because energy is going to be coming from all different kinds of point sources. Um, we're going to be getting energy from our buildings, we're going to be energy from our cars, we're going to be getting energies, energy from both uh, highly uh, managed uh, smart um, uh, grids, uh, and we're also going to be getting energy from decentralised systems. So that digitalisation and decentralisation and then the decarbonisation mean that the energy systems are really going to be very different in the future. And one of the, one of the real challenges we face is that most people in most decision-making roles in utilities, in uh, energy ministries, um, uh, treasuries elsewhere around the world... Um, have a hard time closing their eyes and imagining what those systems look like. Now, it might seem trite, but if you can't imagine it, it's difficult building, uh, building the thing that you can't quite see. And so we are running a sort of 20th century um, uh, rolling stock uh, towards a 20, what has to be a 21st century system, and that's uh, producing a lot of friction and a lot of noise, I think. There's been a revolution in renewable energy technology. The prices are coming down to the point where renewable energy is comparable or cheaper than coal uh, without subsidy in most markets in the world. But we're also seeing a comparable um, drop in the price of storage. And so the ability of renewable energy to take up the strain within um, smart grids around the world is something which is tantalisingly close to realisation, not just in South Australia or elsewhere, but um, uh, in uh, emerging markets where, of course, it's so needed. So part of the vision of this, of this pathway forward, this transition, is to electrify as much as we can and to make that electricity green or clean. However, we are still going to need extraordinary amounts of heating and cooling. And today, the Energy Transitions Commission published a report on hard-to-abate sectors of the economy. So not just focusing on the generation of energy, but focusing on the big users of energy, steel, cement, chemicals, refining, um, and, of course, transport being the other big one. And the Energy Transitions Commission report announces, um, somewhat unsurprisingly, that technically it's going to be feasible to imagine decarbonising those sectors of the economy too by 2050. But I think one of the things that I'm sure Brookings can work on and others is that that vision of a technically feasible steel sector that is you know, um, zero, zero net carbon, right? So it's not producing more carbon. You know, that's going to run up against the reality of today's world where we've got trade wars either in progress or looming. We've got uh, multilateral institutions straining under the burden of how to create the safe space for the conversation between climate and trade. Um, and we've got a, a lack of financial flow and investment into what the future might look like for these sectors. And so we see that it's not just about electrifying everything, but it's also about the transition of the use of energy in transport, the transition of the use of energy in these other big sectors. Which brings me to the piece of the work that we focus on a lot, which is the equity in this transition. The energy system of today has never reached a billion people. And for another two to three billion people, it reaches them, but intermittently, unreliably, and very expensively. 
<coughs> and so what would it be for an energy system, set of energy systems to actually provide universal access reliably, affordably, cleanly going forward? And what is that going to take? Well, it's going to take another shift in mindset. The mindset that has dominated the energy sector for the last 100 years or more has been to think about the amount of gigawatts one needs to produce at what billions of dollars of cost into a centralised grid that will perform at one or other level of efficiency and it will reach as many people as it can reach. And the subsidy will be provided to the utility in order to make that affordable at end point. And the subsidy is provided to fossil fuels because that's mainly what's gone into that grid. Increasingly, for countries that need to transition to make that energy system clean and to have it reach everybody, the conversation is around how much energy do we need to run a health service that delivers health care for everybody? How much energy do we need to run our education service? How much energy do the communities need in order to be able to start small businesses? How much energy do we need for the manufacturing sector, for the ports, for the railways, for the airports, etc.? And if you build the picture up from the bottom up and think about what the actual energy needs are, then you can actually have a very different conversation about the mix or what we call an integration of an energy plan between decentralised energy and centralised between renewables and traditional sources of energy. And those countries that are really going through that think thought process may end up with a very different sort of set of needs than those who are traditionally still thinking about the gigawatts of energy into a sub-performing grid uh, which is only able to absorb fossil fuel energy. So to the billion people who don't have any access and the 2.8 billion who don't have access to clean fuels for cooking, while the grid is being densified and while the grid is being improved, can, and many of their needs can be met by embracing new technology and by embracing new business models and by embracing the idea that we can reach the last mile first. We don't have to wait for a very expensive proposition of extending the grid over the last sand dune to the last you know, nomadic community that doesn't have access. Rather, we can for the Sahel, for the Lake Chad Basin, for South Sudan, for Yemen, for other places in extremis where many of the people live who don't have access to energy, we can exploit decentralised energy for their needs. And I'm not talking about a solar home system that might give you lighting and a cell phone charger. I'm talking about productive use. That's enough watts to be able to provide refrigeration, television, communications, fan, uh, maybe some form of cooling, and allow you to perhaps start a small business or within the community to start running community-owned businesses. And that's the key because at that point you start lifting people's incomes. At that point communities start to have the ability to pay and you can start to build that microgrid into a mini-grid, etc. Again, countries that are embracing the opportunity of decentralised alongside centralised are closing their energy access gap much, much quicker than those who don't. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that SE for All, we track the financial flows into what we call the 20 high-impact countries. So 20 countries account for 80% of the people who don't have access to electricity. 20 countries account for 80% of the people who don't have access to clean fuels for cooking. So we can concentrate our diplomatic, political, financial, economic and technical know-how to help 20 countries make a big uh, uh, difference in these indicators. Um, and what we, what we can see from the tracking of the financial flows into these 20 countries, public and private, international and domestic investment, is that first of all the countries themselves are not investing enough in their own energy sector. Secondly, the countries themselves are not pursuing a reform agenda with enough alacrity or dedication in most cases. But we can also see that the international community is increasing the amount of finance going in, including the amount of development finance going into these countries. But most of it's getting absorbed into big markets. So it goes into India and the Philippines and Bangladesh. Very little of it goes to Burkina or Niger or Mali. And in fact, there is still an old-fashioned bias in development finance in that most of the money is going to grid-connected energy solutions, which is good. And we're glad to see that there's an increase in particular in solar PV grid-connected energy. At the same time, there's only 1.3% of the finance flowing into these countries is going into the off-grid sector. 
So there's either a time lag or there's still a you know, not persuaded by the off-grid solution problem going on. And then finally, I would just say that one concern in the numbers that we looked at, and we looked at the period of 2015, 2016, and I'll admit that the, the data can be quite lumpy because all it takes is one big project to sort of skew the numbers, is that the amount of money going into coal-fired power in these 20 countries tripled. Um, and that means that there are still people out there who believe that coal-fired power is a solution for energy poverty, and there is still uh, access to subsidised technology, subsidised finance, and in some cases subsidised feedstock in the poorest countries, uh, and that this is still an attractive option for policy makers. So I'll leave it there, and perhaps in, in conversation we can get into some of the nitty-gritty of it. Um, I would just say that it is... At the very heart of the Paris Climate Agreement and at the very heart of the SDGs, the notion that we won't leave anybody behind. So you cannot build a decarbonised economy that works for the 1%. You cannot strike a climate deal if Africa's not at the table. Um, and so the idea that we can somehow um, square the decarbonisation that has to happen and at the same time meet people's needs differently is one that inspires young people, is one that inspires entrepreneurs, is one that inspires some political leaders. But I think that the development finance complex, I think uh, many uh, energy uh, decision makers in many parts of the world have not quite yet grasped how revolutionarily different energy systems of the future will be and that now's the time to grasp that uh, opportunity and to try to drive it home so that everybody benefits. Thank you very much. Did, did I already do that incorrectly? Yeah. I failed my first test. Thank you very much. So I'm David Victor. I co-lead with Bruce Jones, the Energy and Climate Initiative here at Brookings. Rachel, thank you so much for being with us today. A lot to talk about, um, including the fact that previously, before this job, you were Special Envoy for Climate at the World Bank. You have some pretty harsh things to say about development finance, so we'll get into that. But first, can you help us say a little bit about what SE for All actually does? Because you've, in this new report about the state of financing for clean energy, and energy access. You've laid this out as a problem that needs more than $50 billion a year in capital investment. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's $30 billion a year going into it. So there's a $20 billion a year gap. Your organization is $10 million a year or so of direct expenditure. And so I'm just curious, how do you get people to, to, to change? So we're, we're the sort of friendly flea on the back of the elephant, right? So we are, uh, or as I sometimes describe myself as your, you know, your favorite aunt, right? So, you know, if you're not doing your best, she's going to take you outside very quietly and have a word with you and not embarrass you in front of your parents. And if you're doing really well, she's going to be enthusiastically screaming in the front row saying, yes. And that, that's, that's what we do, right? So uh, we, we believe that... Um, the, there, is an, there is a pathway to a success against the SDG and against Paris, and that uh, we need to move more quickly and more differently along that pathway in order to succeed. So we marshal the evidence. Um, so I think by putting the evidence in front of people and saying, so what do you think when you see this? There is an extraordinary amount of data sitting captured in big institutions that is not being interrogated with necessarily the appropriate questions. It was gathered for a different reason. It sits to report in a different framework. And by asking that data different questions, I think you, you throw up um, uh, an opportunity for a different response. So we, we gather the data and the evidence. We benchmark progress. And we, we work closely with the World Bank on the regulatory indicators for sustainable energy across 111 markets. So who's doing well, why, what do we understand about that, and what does it take for other countries to replicate? So uh, you know, somewhere, somewhere, somebody somewhere in the world is doing a very, very good job. Um, that's just not known. Good news does not travel fast, right? And then telling the story of success is really important. So you know, why did Morocco... I mean, we know that Morocco made a decision about 10 years ago that it would have a 20-year vision around 
concentrated solar power and becoming a powerhouse in solar energy. But exactly what did it take? You know, where was the delivery unit inside which ministry? And how did that work with the other actors? And what was the role of the domestic capital markets in being able to do that? And how did they attract the blended finance that came from the development banks? And if the climate investment funds were able to provide $700 million worth of concessional finance, then why are the climate investment funds not financed to do that today when we should be speeding up the transition? So we interrogate and ask questions and try try to build sort of tables of different people with a different exam question in order to get a different conversation going. One of the success stories today is India, which is yeah. pretty extraordinary because it wasn't that long ago that the Indian power supply was constantly falling short of targets and so on. Now the situation is totally different. Lots of building of central station power. There's off-grid markets. The Indian government's been setting all of these really bold targets for renewable energy, mm -hmm. bold targets for electrification. Earlier this year, they announced that every village in India is now connected to electric power supply. Maybe not power supply that's on all the time, but mm -hmm. they'll get there over the next few years. What um, it seems like the central part of the Indian story was not about what India did with the rest of the world, the rest of the world telling India what to do, but it was a whole set of policy reforms inside the country. So if that's what matters the most, how can you, how do you help in that situation? So I think that, um, I think what's interesting is to understand, you know, what about what India has done has led to success, and then what of that is replicable or worth replicating or th thinking about. So where are the lessons? Um, and I think the, the Indians are extremely keen, both through the International Solar Alliance and just you know, bilaterally to bring their, their vision of the world to others. And there's a very interesting exchange going on now between India and a number of countries in West Africa where uh, the one thing that India has is scale, right? So it's a massive market. Uh, one of the things that really bedevils um, investment into uh, Africa is you know, the, 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 the breaking down of different jurisdictions. And so, you know, regional integration really helps. So power pools, regional markets, etc. And there's a group of African countries that are now looking at creating an Af sort of a regional market for solar that would allow investment at scale, would allow there to be the same investment rules and the same uh, treatment of solar across at least six jurisdictions to begin with and then more. And so I think that the, the Indians look to us as, a, as a, a neutral brand for a conversation that helps them, you know, be able to export their ideas. In India, I think we're also, you know, a little a, a friendly voice that says, well, OK, so every village has access to electricity, but every household doesn't. And, you know, I think the household survey data that validates what governments report is going to be very important because it's not just governments saying we've achieved the SDG, it's when electrons actually flow through some kind of mechanism and it ends up, you know, actually you know, bringing light to a child or allowing the clinic to operate. That's when the SDG has been um, uh, achieved. So I think our role domestically is to engage India in a conversation about what does success really look like. Um, one final thing I would say is that India, uh, because it has got some very interesting institutions outside of government, um, has, is, is in a very interesting position when it comes to sort of other aspects of the challenge, including cooling. And recently, uh, Rocky Air conditioning. Met, yeah, um, well, air conditioning and then, you know, design of buildings. And there's all kinds of things one can do to cool, not just the air conditioner. But Rocky Mountain Institute, Terry, the government of India, um, and something that we're associated with in SE for All as well, just launched a cooling prize. The country and the company and the, 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 the R&D that captures the ability to be able to produce a hyper-efficient, HFC-free cooling device that is retailed, which retails at an affordable price for the lower to emerging middle class. And these are the people who want it, and once they've got it, never want to go back to something without it. That market is two, three billion people wide, um, worldwide. And being able to manufacture into that market is, is extraordinary. And I think, 
you know, that's something that the US and Europe have sort of lost sight of. And I think that's something where India and others clearly see that, that that's to their advantage. What, um, uh, you have a lot of negative things to say about investment in coal, uh, and yet half of the coal plants that, are, that have received uh, new, new financial commitments that you talk about in this new report are in India. Mm -hmm. India has had this extraordinary success in building out the grid and so on. What, what do you say to somebody from the coal industry who says, yeah, coal's a problem, but the problem of electrification is even more acute, and so therefore we need to continue investing in, in coal power plants? So I'm particularly critical of the narrative that suggests that new coal is going to solve the one billion people who don't have access to energy problem. Because most of those people are living in rural areas. And if they're not living in rural areas, they're living in peri-urban areas of fast-growing cities. And in most cases, they are not going to get their electricity from coal because the grid is never going to be extended to them. Hasn't been up to now. Don't see that it's going to get there quickly uh, in the future. Second reason I'm critical of coal is that most, uh, most emerging countries are extremely, um, are, are, are caught in a bind between the need to have affordable energy now and their deep, deep concerns about quali air quality, especially as they rapidly urbanize. And, you know, coal, coal is, I, I don't think, the affordable option in the, in, the short, in the medium to long run. And I think it endangers air quality. And as we know more and more about what air quality does, to um, the mental health and development of, of children and to uh, what it's doing to um, the, health, the health status of adults. You know, this is not something um, that you would ideally do if you've got alternatives. The challenge, I think, is to provide a like-for-like -like alternative. So if you can, if somebody's gonna come and sell you, outside of India, a, you know, out-of-the-box, um, cheap technology with, a subs with subsidized finance, and perhaps subsidized feedstock, and you know that you can build it, and within two years it'll be running, and it, it will work in your kind of old-fashioned grid, then that's concrete. You can reach out, touch it. You can electorally promise it, right? Uh, the alternative is what? Is um, uh, solar grid connected, wind grid connected, solar with hydro, geothermal and solar, whatever. You, in too many countries, will have to piece together a coalition of acronyms. Um, you will get the subsidised finance, but it's going to come to get together in a difficult, uh, perhaps, uh, negotiation. You're going to have to meet uh, performance standards and safeguards. Um, and people are telling you that that's going to take for forever, although it shouldn't have to. Um, and so, you Legal know... Call. So, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got to, we've got to um, make it easier to choose the right thing. And that's where Mayor Bloomberg and others are putting so much energy, not only into revealing the economics and the short-termism of coal, but also trying to get people around the table to make the alternative more accessible, um, uh, sort of in a, in a functional way. For India, I think that there are um, increasing numbers of, of coal plants um, are closing down now because they're not economically feasible. And one of, the, one of the challenges for India is that private finance stopped flowing into coal a long time ago. And uh, it is public finance and public banks that hold the debt on most of those um, coal-fired assets. And one of the stories of the energy transition is going to be the sort of bad assets that will be held by the public purse whether it's in Europe, whether it's in uh, India, or whether it's in China, as their public money is investing in coal through the Belt and Road Initiative. And so you, you, you've got a double whammy, which is that this isn't good investment, but then those assets which are there, which may become uneconomic within you know, 10 to 15 years, that's going to sit on the public purse. And so there's a very interesting sort of split between where private finance and public finance is going to end up in the transition. Let's talk about the Belt and Road Initiative for a little bit. Uh, Chinese banks in various forms are responsible for about a quarter mm -hmm. of the international finance flowing broadly into this, uh, into this space, and it's growing rapidly. Um, big chunk of it's connected to coal, we just talked about. A big chunk of it is kind of broadly connected to the Belt and Road Initiative. How do you see the Chinese 
internalizing the message here. I mean, the message is, if you invest in coal plants, these are going to become stranded assets, and that's going to look bad on the Chinese balance sheet, that we ought to move more quickly to renewables, we ought to more, move, move more quickly to off-grid solutions, and then when you look on the ground, they're doing the opposite. So what do you tell the Chinese? Well, I think, so I think that, and we were talking, we were talking before we, we came on stage, is that you know, we, we tend to project onto China a sort of monolithic certainty that is not something that we experience in our own countries, right? So government's not joined up. Except here, 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 uh, here. the government's completely joined up. <laughs> so, you know, Tony Blair always used to say that the aspiration was for joined up government. And I think that's everybody's aspiration everywhere. And I think the same is true in China. Obviously, they've just created a new ministry and there's a fairly substantial reorganization. And you know, energy is still managed within one part of the government where the Belt and Road is in another. Um, the uh, overall coordination of climate change is, has moved places as well. And so I think that there's still some sort of question about how that all gets uh, uh, organized so it's coherent. Um, I think it's also interesting to look at the financing. The, if you look at the energy infrastructure investment through the Belt and Road over the recent years, and this is number, these are numbers from Boston University and WRI and others, the vast majority of the financing is public Chinese investment, and that's gone for, mainly for coal, and the private has gone mainly for um, renewables. Now, it, you know, are those numbers known and understood and sort of produced in their stark reality something that is the everyday thinking of some of the policymakers? I think that's the conversation. Is is that the picture that you want? Um, is that is that intentional? Is that just the way it turned out in the first few years of the Belt and Road? What's the long range plan? Why why can't China be part of a closing the energy access gap story? Because this is going to be. This is going to take China into even further realms uh, of the world. So, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a dialogue at the moment. There's a lot of questions, open questions, um, and I think at the end of the day, there is. Um, it's not a monolithic narrative, and there are certainly those within the higher echelons of, of policy making and power who do not want China associated with some. Um, push towards, um, you know, a, a planetary sort of cataclysm, right? And remember that this is the China that calls its, you know, calls its economic plan one for a beautiful China. This is the China that's going to host the Biodiversity Convention in 2020, where a, two big global narratives are going to clash, right? The narrative that we all have to live on half of the planet because nature needs the other half, and the decarbonisation of the global economy. And at the moment, those two don't quite jive. Um, and it's all going to happen in China's lap. Let's talk a little more about where the money is going to come from. The scale of the problem that you've outlined is 3 billion people who don't have access to clean cooking, mm -hmm. roughly a billion who don't have access to electricity, reliable electricity. The, the nature of the problem is mainly a residential problem, and a large part of it is rural. The capital is mainly flowing into industrial uses and urban uses, and so there's this disconnect. So traditionally, we we solve these disconnects with development finance, mm -hmm. multilateral development institutions, bilateral, and so on. Why aren't they better aware of the problem and focusing more of their resources? I think the, the public sector international finance is actually shrinking, uh, with the exception of the Chinese part of the picture. And, and so I'm, I'm just curious as to what they don't understand about this that is that is making it hard for them to do their job? So I think it's, it's only in the reasonably recent past that, uh, that the focus on access has come, up the, um, has come up the sort of priority list. And I was at the bank when SC for All as an idea was started by the Secretary General. You know, and I, at that time, that was not the purpose of the energy complex. Um, so that's begun, that's begun to shift. I think there is also uh, an incentivization to do big stuff, and there's a lot of big stuff that needs to be done. And most of the transmission and distribution financing in the grids of the developing world are done by the MDBs, Asia Development Bank, uh, Africa Development Bank, uh, World Bank. So that bias is still in the system. So it you know, it's, a, it's an ocean tanker that needs to sort of like change uh, its bearing a little bit. But I also think that um, some of the banks were very slow to pick up on off-grid. And they were doing sort of boutique stuff, sort of off the books. Um, but this wasn't a big push. 
And so now the, tr the trick is to now catch up and work out where, where can they play the most important role. And it, this isn't just in finance. If you look at major sort of, you know, revolutionary shifts in development, whether it's microfinance or mobile banking or the use of, of what mobile telephony can do for service delivery and things like this, a lot of the market creation, a lot of the market surveys, a lot of the information that is needed for small startups and new businesses to come and crowd into this exciting new space is done by uh, multilaterals or their advisory services or their, these pieces. And that we need a lot of that because you know there are extraordinary, um, extraordinarily exciting businesses starting up every day in Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire in Kenya and Ethiopia now in, um, in Uganda across uh, Africa in particular. But each one of them is having to go out and sort of from capital expenditure go and do that that necessary spade work. And these are the kinds of things that if the uh, if the if the multilaterals embrace the space a little bit more energetically, um, could make things easier to flow on the financing. Um, then then I think the question is whether or not the pressures on some of these banks and the way that these have been internalised mean that they've become very conservative. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of climate question is, um, if guys, if we don't do it now, what are we going to do with all this money in 15 to 20 years when climate impacts have made the situation even worse? Uh, so I think there is a, a need to um, take risk um, and to be uh, able to explain that to the shareholders and to take it in very specific locations on very specific things that will get economies going and that will get... Um, that will get uh, income levels rising. And I'll give you one other point, which is for the shareholders, not for the, for the banks, uh, all of the MDB's management, which is that we are going to be prepared, or we will have to sink hundreds of millions of dollars of humanitarian assistance and security spending into some of these parts of the world, because the people who are in them are ravaged by the impacts of climate change droughts that have gone from every 10 years to every five years to every two years to being sort of semi-permanent. Um, they are being uh, picked off by violent extremism, um, uh, moving in uh, in exploiting what is a sort of economically not hopeless but pretty hopeless situation for many of them. And our concerns about migration, our concerns about security and our need to provide humanitarian assistance will from a spending point of view, be to the nth degree more than what it would take to really coordinate and perhaps have a sort of major push on yeah, solar irrigation for, 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 for some uh, agricultural um, innovation, for putting uh, energy in health clinics so that there are decent health services. Um, you know, these are the things where the mindset is going to have to shift, and the risk-taking is going to have to shift. And that's with the shareholders of these institutions, not just with the management. Do you think that there's a group of shareholders that would be willing and able to point to the World Bank, point to the regional banks, and say, thou shalt go out and take more risk, and here's the nature of the risks? Well, I think if we don't, we're going to have a very, very hard time to meet the SDGs. What... Um, a couple more questions for me, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience for, for some commentary. You said in your opening remarks that you see an energy system of the future that is much more decentralized, uh, digital, um, and what we see on the ground is this kind of incredible promise around off-grid solutions and so on. You mentioned there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in East Africa in particular. But when you take a step back and look at the numbers, 1% mm -hmm. <clears throat> or so of the finance is going into these off-grid systems and almost all the rest of it is going to the grid. Um, is that just because grid-related investments are much less risky and much bigger and so it's kind of easier to do those deals? Or are we seeing the kind of pointy edge of what's going to be a very rapid radical transformation? Um, I think that it's, um, well, to answer the question another way, in, in, if you look at Kenya, where they've set a very um, clear political goal for energy access, where they've done a lot to um, set the policy table correctly for an expansion of uh, decentralised energy alongside what they're doing for the grid, 
And you've also got the ability to innovate off a backbone of mobile telephony that not every other country has. You're starting to, and you've got a liquid capital market, well, more liquid and, and, and deeper than, than most countries in Africa. You are starting to see the closing of the energy access gap moving at quite a pace. Um, and so the question is then, so of those elements, what could be done by others? You're starting to see a rural electrification plan come into parts of, uh, come partly into place in parts of uh, Nigeria. You've seen a change of heart in Cote d'Ivoire, where the current government has realised that actually by exploiting um, decentralised energy, they could meet some goals that they thought they were going to have to very expensively meet by funding through the grid. You've started to see a success in Ethiopia, which of course is this huge energy generator for the whole region through its large scale hydro and others, but you know, had left energy access out of the mix, but now there's an orientation towards, okay, how do we reach uh, the rural population? So, and they start, start laying a policy table differently. They start making reforms. Bangladesh has moved very quickly. India has moved very quickly. Now Pakistan has an opportunity to learn and start picking up the pace. So I think that um, the finance will flow to where it can um, uh, make a return and where it can be persuaded that there is a you know, medium to long term future. And that requires uh, a policy environment which is supportive or at least benign. Um, and so those countries that are beginning to make those reforms, unsurprisingly, are beginning to see uh, a greater level of investment. So I think that what we're seeing is the leading edge of what could be something substantial, but it's not going to be substantial without policy reform, and it's going to need a development finance, bilateral and multilateral, to take a bit more of a risk, I think, on, on some of these businesses. So this extraordinary success story in Kenya is yet when you take a step back, the numbers overall in Kenya are dominated by the grid. One yeah. project in particular, the coal-fired power plant in Lamu that would use imported coal. And you're telling us to kind of look less at which the macro numbers. Which they don't num need. But, <clears throat> but you're telling us to look less at the macro numbers and more at where where the market's really shifting, which is off-grid. Yeah, so Kenya, so Kenya has been able to exploit geothermal um, and has managed to um, manage, manage uh, investment and its own domestic resources to be able to take the upfront risk that comes from ex exploring geothermal. I mean, the, the cost of geothermal, the, the problem with geothermal is affording the exploration and deciding where to put the well pads, right? That's the expensive part of it. So they were able to do that with international support and they're reaping the benefit of that. They obviously have um, uh, opportunity for hydro to be imported from Ethiopia and those transmission lines have been built, again, with international support. They have uh, extraordinary wind resources and they've got the very controversial project at Lake Takana, um, which um, you know, is the largest wind farm in sub-Saharan Africa. But it's, um, it's evacuating energy through a transmission line which doesn't exist at the moment. And uh, the penalties for the non-transmission non lie with the taxpayer um, in Kenya. So there's a really interesting sort of case study there for any students in the room about um, how we do these things going forward. And then the solar, and then so you've got solar home systems, mini grids, micro grids. The government now has you know, basically laid a, a policy environment which is going to encourage uh, mini grid development by you know, equalizing the tariff across the utility and uh, mini grid suppliers. And that's one of the big things because what, what chokes off mini grid development is the fear that when the grid arrives, you won't be able to um, operate. Um, and also the fact that, you know, and without some kind of policy environment which treats uh, both in a, in a transparent way, if you are paying more for electricity from a mini grid and you know that your cousin living in the city gets it cheaper from the utility, yeah, you start to have yeah. uh, problems. But, you know, we've seen countries start to deal with that and I think that's, that's going to be the future. Now. Two last questions from me. First one is about cooking. The problem yep. is a billion people without access to electricity and three billion people who rely on traditional fuels for cooking and heating. Mm -hmm. Almost all these discussions, including what we've just been talking about, get focused on the electric part of it, and they forget cooking. Um, your own, the numbers that you put together show that there's $30 billion a year, roughly, going into electricity and $30 million a year going into cooking. Now, 
there's some problems with the accounting because yeah. cooking is hard. It's off grid. It's way out in the rural areas. Nobody really knows what's going on. But that's a factor of a thousand. What is this problem over time? basically going to become a problem of cooking and heating because we're going to solve the electricity and the cooking and heating sort of side of it is just too hard? Or what, where, where do you see progress being made on the cooking? No, it certainly looks that way. The, the places where we see progress in cooking are in countries where at the senior political level, somebody has said this is unconscionable. Modi, uh, Peña Nieto. Uh, the Peruvian administ two, two administrations before in Peru and elsewhere. And at that point, you know, people have become galvanized. So in India, the subsidy was taken away from kerosene and put on LPG. And the Indian oil company was told to get the LPG out uh, into the rural areas. And the plan is that they will go to solar cooking at scale or the grid will have arrived and you'll have solar energy coming through a grid into a stove. Um, so these are all top down and it makes a big difference. But you, what you really need as well is bottom up. And one of the real problems, one of the real reasons why this problem has not moved more quick or the solutions have not moved more quickly is because it's a silent minority. Right. So those women who have to spend five hours going and finding animal dung or firewood of the right size or whatever, um, you know, that cost... Is, is just lost into the economy. It's not, there's no opportunity cost there. It's just that's what they do. So when you, if you could capture the opportunity of those women for, for five hours planting seeds or involved in some other productive activity and you can start monetizing that or thinking about that in those terms, let me tell you, you would not allow you know, hundreds of millions of, of Africans to still be searching for fuel this way. Secondly, um, there's a lot of m mythology about what the poor do and do not do with their resources. And most, uh, most uh, people living on very low incomes spend an extraordinary amount of those incomes on being able to cook. So they will pay the very high price for the kerosene. They'll spend 30 to 40% of their income on being able to cook. You imagine you spending 30 to 40% of your paycheck on cooking, no, I mean, th this is extraordinary. So um, we have to understand this market. And I, I think that the final thing I would say is that I, I worry that this issue became a sort of development fetish, which is that we obsessed over you know, designing cook stoves that people might use um, and then trying to get them out to everybody for free. If you don't have access affordable access to fuel for that stove, that stove's going to sit there and it's not going to get used. And so I think that what's happening now in the clean cooking world is a, a, a much broader discussion about what's it going to take to create markets for clean fuels which are affordable to the people on low income who need them and what are the stoves that can be used with those fuels at an affordable price? At which point you start talking about, you know, a much bigger opportunity than sort of, you know, trying to sort of vertically penetrate with one device or another. Um, and, um, but let me tell you, you know, if it, if it were, I, I do think the female face on the problem has um, suppressed its, its significance. But now that we know that four million people die every year from indoor air pollution, and we know that you know, cooking that meal is imperiling a child's health, not only in terms of pulmonary disease, but their ability to learn and their ability to then be productive in society going forward, this has to rise up the political priority list. Very briefly, last question. Um, seems like a lot of the success stories around clean cooking fuels are stories about LPG, liquefied petroleum gas. Mm -hmm. It's a fossil fuel but it's used for truly important purposes. Do you worry that the anti-fossil fuels kind of wing of decarbonization is gonna get in the way of kind of making the world safe for LPG? Yeah, I mean, it has done. Um, I think there's been a, 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 you know, I think it was a big fight uh, over the last decade or more uh, around that. Um, I think the LPG um, industry has also sort of sat a little bit too comfortably you know, on its hands and sort of made general sort of positive noises about willing to be a big part of the solution, but they make their money selling LPG to the middle class. 
and they've been waiting for somebody to, you know, give them a subsidy to reach out to the, to the, low, to the lower income people. And I think that, you know, you can make the case that you should transfer the subsidy from sort of kerosene, heavy fuel oil to LPG, but that should be a step down and it should disappear over time. It's not permanent. And so I would like to see a little bit more creative energy and a, a little bit more dynamism in the, in the gas sector itself because it could be doing a lot more than it's doing. We haven't learnt the lessons of distribution finance and consumer finance from other aspects of development. We could apply those across. Um, so, yeah, I think that there, there was definitely those who were saying, you know, gas is not, you know, gas should not be a transition. But I, I would take you to Rwanda. So, small, densely populated country um, uh, with alarming rates of deforestation, um, came out with an electricity plan for universal electrification, realised it hadn't dealt with cooking, came up with a plan, and its plan is, I think, to go from like 20% to 60% in just five or six years, and it wants to do that by having LPG in the cities and big secondary towns, and then to use um, enhanced biomass, so pellets and others, uh, other systems for the rural areas. If it can get to there, it can arrest deforestation. It can start to see incomes and women's lives improve. And then it will work out how to get itself off gas. So I, I think that you have to work with governments when they have a vision. What we need is more governments to have a vision. Great, thank you. Time for some questions. Uh, right here, sir. Yeah. You have to wait for the microphone and tell us who you are and ask your question. Yeah. Hello, this is, my name is Kim. I am a student uh, from Maxwell School, Syracuse University. Uh, I came from a very sensitive country in terms of climate change from Nepal. So, yeah, it's really interesting that discussion. My question is, uh, when I was in Nepal, I worked as a teacher for long, and, and my realization is that uh, if we just invest a lot in the education for the sustainable energy that will be very uh, effective and efficient in future. So in relation to this, so can you share some ideas how the uh, investment in education is going in terms of sustainable energy? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, well, I, I think that, uh, you know what, I think one of the concerns that, that I have is that there's sort of a, an inertia. Um, well, all systems can, can be inert, right? But uh, I think that um, we, we are at a particular moment in time where technology and business modeling and you know, new ways of financing offer us an opportunity to, uh, in particular, to close the, the access gap for everyone. And then obviously we need to do that while decarbonizing. And you know, if the if the if we were te if it was ten years ago, and I said there it, it's technically possible to close the energy access gap in Africa, you know, I mean, you would have had a, a, a reason to sort of boo me off the stage. But I, I but it is technically possible now, and so the education is is around what's it going to take to sort of move in a hockey stick up an energy transition which you know builds access in and doesn't just exclude people because it's unaffordable. Um, and I think that uh, that's, there's a time lag on that. Um, uh, I think that you can specifically study the technology, you can specifically study um, energy systems, but I mean, we are, we are, many of the institutions I've talked about, most of their staff and most of their expertise is on the energy systems of the past, right? And when I was the vice president of the bank, we talked about the fact that our transport sector and our energy sector staff uh, were mostly coming out of, you know, degrees 20 years earlier. That must have been they, a very popular conversation. Well, yeah, yeah but I mean, it, it's, it, you know, it, there's, they had deep, deep, deep project expertise, which we needed, especially because you're managing a portfolio, which is very... But you need to then complement that with systems thinking, et cetera. So we need the systems thinking to be coming out of the schools and colleges now. Back corner there, please. Yep. Hello. Um, my name is Anne Solkowski. Back in the 1980s, I lived and worked in the country of Niger. I became aware that little girls 
could not go to school because they had to go gather firewood for their families. Yet, um, back in the 1960s, the French had set up an infrastructure to transmit school lessons into the remote parts of the country via microwave and satellite to solar-powered TV sets in the villages. Is that infrastructure possible a possible beginning to broaden the dispersal of energy to these remote parts of the country? Well, I, I, I mean, the, the, the technology that's available today means that you can stand up a microgrid, you know, uh, almost instantaneously in a displaced people's camp in the north of Niger or in a village, um, and, you know, making, making that uh, a, a sustainable, building a sustainable economic model around a mini grid is more complex. Um, but it, it goes to the heart of what kind of concessional finance we're prepared to use when to, to bring these systems into these villages. But uh, the penetration rate of electrification outside of Niamey and the major towns is still in the single digits in Niger. And so most people don't have access, and they don't have access to energy for productive use. So people are, um, you know, uh, working uh, what is very marginal land now because of climate change and drought, and they they don't have access to, you know, very affordable sort of solar powered uh, irrigation and things like this. So I, I I would say that the second thing is that I was um, I was in the the clinic. There's a major clinic in Niger in Niamey. Uh, which uh, is one of the only clinics for a thousand miles around that's able to treat obstetric fistula. And there's one doctor, um, 650 uh, uh, beds, but, you know, more than a thousand women. Um, and, uh, it, so it, obviously the rest of the people, I was there with the president of the Security Council, Margaret Wallstrom. I was there with the Deputy Secretary General. I was there with the Africa Union, you know, so it was a big entourage. Um, and everybody's sort of like talking about the doctors. I, I, you know, I talked to the administrator. I said, well, what's the electricity like? You know, what's the power like? He said, oh, it goes out 27 times a day. Uh, and I said, well, do you have backup power? He's like, yeah. So we went around the back and we saw a generator that was older than I am. And let me tell you, you don't want your generator to be older than me. Um, and so I, for me, I would have thought that uh, there was a fairly, you know, reasonable solution to that um, Go online and look at Project Bow. We we raised a bunch of us raised a hundred thousand pounds earlier this year to put a solar system on the neonatal clinic in the main hospital in Freetown, Sierra Leone, with um, generators out the back, and you know, no premature baby dies for the lack of electricity in that clinic now. So this can be done. Um, I'm not saying that these are. Uh, you know, I'm not Pollyanna about this, but, but this is not beyond our means. I mean, this is an area where technology has really changed a lot. Yep. I mean, it's changed education perhaps, but I think the impact on healthcare has been just truly extraordinary. And, and of course it is diesel genset. You do need a diesel genset as backup, but diesel genset as a backup to a solar system is a lot better than having nothing. Right here. We had some questions from the left, now we're gonna hear from the right. Uh -huh, great. Uh, Chris Bentley worked for the Forest Service, and uh, I know you touched on this a little bit. Do you bit. rake? Uh, do I what? Sorry. Rake. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> there you I'm go. sorry. Yes, of course I do. No. Um, yeah, so you, you touched on this uh, briefly about sort of having the political will to have some of these goals be achieved. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that technologically it, these goals are achievable, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the you know, the feasibility of there actually being that political will to actually achieve these? So, I mean, yes. I mean, so, so if we, so eight, 20 countries, 80% of the problem. Take India out because they're moving at their own speed and they're, you know, Bangladesh is moving at its own speed, Philippines. So let's go to Africa. 16 of the 20 countries in sub-Saharan Africa Kenya's trucking along, doing okay now. You know, Ethiopia's beginning to pick up the pace. Uganda's moving. Okay, so then you start talking about just that, like let's talk about ten countries in West Africa. So now, then, you know, the World Bank, the Africa Development Bank, the French, the EU, Power Africa, 
from the US. I mean, everybody's there or thereabouts, right? So the question is, with the kind of data that we produce energizing in finance, you sit down and you put the data in front of them and say, OK, guys, what can we do with what's already pledged and committed, right? I mean, we don't need to have another pledging conference. There's a lot of money in the system. In the run-up to the Paris Climate Agreement, there was a $10 billion commitment around the Africa Renewable Energy Initiative. There were, the French have got a big initiative around the Allianz from the Obama administration, but continued under this administration, Power Africa. There is a lot of money in the system and a lot of technical know-how in the system. It's not yet reaching uh, these countries. Now, these countries have got to get their reform agenda going. They've got to do all of the things that they need to do. Be great if they had bigger um, capital markets. Be great if they invested more of their own GDP in their own energy solutions. And the mindset has to shift. Most of these countries have utilities which are, you know, to put it mildly, not in good economic shape, right? So there's a lot of institutional and governance stuff that needs to happen. But yes, we can we can do this. The alternative is that we are going to be putting humanitarian assistance in. We're going to be putting holding camps in the north of these countries. We're going to be keeping people there because we don't want them in Europe. And it's going to cost us an awful lot more. I mean, if you want to use that argumentation, there's other argumentation to use as well. Behind, no, sorry, behind you. Hi, my name's Sophie Huber. I'm an intern at the Austrian Embassy. And I had a question. Um, so... What's going to happen with renewable technologies once they don't work anymore? For example, in electric vehicles, electric batteries, solar panels, what's going to happen with those afterwards? Has anybody thought about the recycling process, or are they just going to end up in a landfill and make things worse in the future? So, yeah. This is an absolutely brilliant question, and so this is a huge opportunity for Austrian innovation and uh, solutions. So. The, the, one that, the one that always preoccupies my mind is that if you take a taxi in Fiji, it's going to be with a nine-year-old um, you know, Prius. Um, and I think at 10 years, the battery on a Prius is kind of like you know, kaput. So uh, you know, there's been, over the years, there's been sort of attempts to sort of figure out what to do about that. I, th I think it's a boat coming from Japan you know, picking up all those batteries and taking them back. So this is actually a very important issue. Um, and there's some very initial work beginning to happen on what this, uh, what this begins to look like. Um, and I don't have all of the solutions for it, but it, this, is, this is going to be uh, something that has to be uh, built into. So for me, the International Renewable Energy Agency, when it was set up, you know, what, 10 or 12 years ago, yeah, you know, this, this was an agency that had to sort of fight to, to, to get renewables taken seriously. You're supposed to be a cheerleader for the renewable energy industry. Yes, right? a cheerleader for it. And so now, you know, both, I mean, they've succeeded, but they've also been able to ride the wave of the renewable energy revolution. I think now there are a number of things where IRENA needs to sort of like sort of drive forward. It will have a, a new director next year. Um, and I, this is one area. I think the other is that lots of bad things happen, even though renewable energy is great when you're acquiring land quickly. Um, and so, you know, making sure that the renewable energy is maintaining the best standards of land acquisition and social safeguard protection. There, there are sort of a number of things where I think the renewable energy industry, as it matures, is going to have to grapple with, and I see that as part of the, a norm-setting role for IRENA. Are you saying that there ought to be like almost codes of conduct about recycling cobalt and lithium and right stewardship of land, or you think the industry can sort that out on their own without? Well, I, I, th I mean, normally voluntary, some some kind of voluntary, um, you know, standards within the industry would pre be a precursor to any kind of um, uh, global regulation, and I, you know, I think the renewable energy industry has to be alive to that, and I, I think the leaders of that are. But given how much is manufactured in China, the Chinese have to be part of this conversation from the get-go. Sir, right here. Thank you. Hi, Carl Golliving, a retired special agent, U.S. Customs, domain reference and ideal lives on .net. Uh, my first job out of grad school in 1980 was here in D.C. at the Center for Renewable Resources. There you go. And I own two Gen Z brand electric scooters, and the Mercury Grand Marquis. So there's a little disconnect there. But, <laughs> you can uh, use my, the scooters to tow the Marquis. When no, no, I, I have, a, I have a, a, a motorcycle carrier on the back. I can <laughs> continue. <laughs> okay. 
My question in part is drawn from uh, the book Myths, Lies, and Oil Wars by F. William Engdahl, who argues that uh, really the, the labeling of petroleum as a fossil fuel was a uh, branding in order to pr create a perceived scarcity and hence a, a, a price beneficial market for petroleum. In fact, it seems to be a, a, a geochemically generated uh, liquid mineral in the, in the crust of the earth that uh, Vast reserves exist off the coast of Haiti, but yet Haiti politically is not allowed to develop those. Mm -hmm. And how would you respond to, to uh, Czech President uh, Václav Klaus in 2007, uh, after experiencing decades of communism, said that extreme environmentalism, climate uh, regulation is really the new communism? Well, I had the benefit of being on a platform with him in, 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 in Moscow uh, three years ago. So... Um, I, I, you know, let, let's put extreme environmentalism to one side for the moment. The problem that we have is that uh, as we put carbon into the atmosphere, we now know, and we have known for quite some time, but now we know with no plausible deniability whatsoever that this is, in, this is doing damage to, uh, the, to damage to the planet and it's doing damage to other species and it's doing damage to ourselves. And so the question now is, for those companies that have been in the business of digging this stuff up one way or the other, and those companies that are in the business of burning it, manipulating and doing anything with it, have to transform themselves, in the words of Robert Sokoloff from Princeton, into not energy companies, or, you know, they, they were oil and gas companies and then they were energy companies and now they're energy services companies and now they're going to, I mean, one of them told me last week that they were rebranding in some other direction. No, we're now in the business of managing carbon molecules and we're in the carbon molecule business and that means we can dig it up but we can't let any of it escape into the atmosphere. So we have to use it, we have to capture it we have to use it again. We have to store it. We, whatever we do with it, it can't go into the atmosphere. So that's the challenge. It's a challenge of the existing companies and it's a challenge for everything we do going forward. And I think that if you, if you consider yourself as a carbon management company, then that becomes, I think, you know, a very important way of seeing that the deep technological experience of these companies is something that we need going forward. There is no trajectory there's no there's no body out there that is talking about the energy transition who doesn't talk about the need for significant capture of carbon and significant use of carbon so it, it we're not sort of we need, we can't just go cold turkey on the fossil fuel part of our economy we just have to uh, wean ourselves off it over time and manage that carbon more effectively than we are at the moment we have time for one more question sir very briefly uh, yes, I'm Paul Arvison with Solar Household Energy, and we develop and distribute solar cookers in sunny places around the world. And we've had some small but successful projects ongoing. Uh, I have a contact up in at the UN, another representative with Solar Cookers International, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could help us uh, meet with us and uh, discuss some of the other questions that we have about implementing solar cooking. Thank you. I'm going to take that as a comment, and that's going to give us a chance for one more question. You've been very patient in the very back corner there. So in terms of climate are. change, do you happen to know if we were to solve the energy problem, if the Amazon uh, habitat, from what scientists say, is being clear-cut at such a rate that it will kind of be uh, unsustainable onto itself? in its water system. What would happen if um, they're correct and we, we really lose much of the Amazon in terms of climate change? Uh, if we solved the energy use but lost uh -huh. what they call, I guess, yeah. the lungs of the planet. Or so, yeah, so there, there, are big, so there are big component parts of... Of, of what we will need to do in order to decarbonize our economy, right? So we, we, energy is a big piece of it. Transport is a big piece of it. Uh, at the moment, the way in which we manage land and deforestation is a big piece. These are contributing factors to climate change, right? 
So these are all big chunks of the problem. And so just doing one is not enough. We've got to do all of the above. And the report in October from the IPCC, which said that, you know, can we get to one and a half degrees or not and what it would take, we, we need urgent action on all three. So anything that imperils the progress that was being made in Brazil and has started to, that's, that has started to, that rate of progress has started to diminish and things have started to go the wrong way. But now with the new elected president of, um, of Brazil, there's a big question mark over policies that may be introduced there. Anything that imperils the health of the Amazon and the ability to reforest, aforest as much land as possible going forward um, means that we are not on track. So we need an energy revolution. We need a revolution in transport. We need a revolution in the way we build and live in cities. We need a revolution in the way we manage our agriculture. We need to reforest and aforest as quickly as possible. We are going to have to find ways to pull more and more carbon out of the atmosphere. We need all of the above. So even if we got energy right, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't have to worry about the way we grow food, the way we manage our land, and the way that we manage forests. Very quickly, before we close here, very quickly, we're talking about a global problem mm -hmm. of profound importance that normally when we talk about global problems like this, we talk about what can the United States do. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned the United States once in passing, which mm -hmm. is about the Power Africa program, which is still ongoing. Um, but set up by a previous administration. Are the Americans just absent from the scene? No. Um, but I think that, um, no, they're not absent from the scene at all. Um, they're present in the climate discussions. They're present at the UN. They are present in the IEA uh, governing body. They're, they're present everywhere. I think um, where much of the rest of the world has a question mark is um, uh, which United States is showing up and what sense of urgency and appetite is there for joint action. And if I think back over the last 20, 25 years of sustainable development diplomacy, there have been moments when there is no agreement at the global level possible. But what has always happened is that a small group of countries maybe with some businesses and some civil society actors and some people from the academy have got together and said, we've got to push forward on this, on forests, on uh, short-lived climate pollutants, um, on agricultural research, on, I mean, you name it. And I can't think of one instance where a working coalition hasn't been formed in advance of a global consensus without the United States being one of those countries. And I think the world is trying to work out what to do. <laughs> um, I mean, people are moving ahead without, and people are trying to include the US in and sort of saying, you know, when you feel like it, come on on, you know. So I, I don't, it's not that the rest of the world wants to turn their back. I mean, the US is a necessary nation, and US, the US Academy, US think tanks, states, US businesses, I mean, you know, it's all needed, right? Uh, U.S. science, U.S. technology. Um, but I think the world is just adjusting to a sense of absence. Please join me in thanking Rachel Kite. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.